I'm excited for our program. Um, my name is Cassie Holman. I'm the horticulture agent in the Post Rock District, and that is five counties in north central Kansas. Um, and my home office is in Beloit. So um, I'm really excited to talk about birds tonight. We have Chuck Audie, who is like an expert birder, <laughs> who's joining us to, to do the presentation. Um, First, I kind of wanted to talk about like how this got started. So February has been like bird month in our office. Um, we got our 4-H clubs involved and they have been doing fun activities. So I wanted to show you one of those. Um, they've been making bird wreaths. So it's kind of a project you make with um, bird seed and some other ingredients. And then they've also been making um, houses, bird houses for wrens. So. I wanted to share that with you. Um, if you do want the recipe for this, um, we have a, we made kind of a tutorial on it that will be on our Post Rock YouTube channel. Um, but a couple of things before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that um, if you could keep your, um, your videos, you can have that on or off, but just make sure you're muted so that Chuck can present. Um, we will have a question and answer session towards the end. Um, so please save your questions or um, write them in the chat and we'll get to that towards the end. Um, this webinar will also be recorded, so don't worry if you're trying to take notes really quick. Um, we will get that done and send it to you probably by the end of the week. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I want to again welcome Chuck. Um, he has been birding for a long time. He, I know he participates in the annual bird count um, he's co-authored an awesome Birds of Kansas book. Um, I even remember at one extension meeting, I saw him take out binoculars and look at some birds out the window. So he is very passionate about this and he's gonna share some great um, tips for feeding birds and attracting birds to our yard. So um, I'll go ahead and let Chuck share his screen. Getting going on this and I am ready. You want me to go ahead and start? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, great. Well, good to be with all of you here tonight. I see a lot of numbers popping up there, so that's great. Um, I, I would just love that we could be all together in person doing a meeting, especially on a beautiful evening like this, but we, we deal with we play with the cards we're dealt and we're going to do the best we can and go along. So yes, I, I just a few brief things about myself. I've been the Geary County Extension agent for well, let's just say since the early 80s, um, I have been a bird watcher since I was four years old. My mother was a bird watcher. My grandmother was a bird watcher. I was genetically predisposed. I never had a chance. It was bound to happen. But the fun thing is I get to take my passion and put it together with, with my job and, and present programs like this. So if anybody has had bird feeders out the past two weeks, you have noticed that they have been kind of busy. And we're going to talk about this. And there's been a lot of new questions that have come up just in the past couple of weeks from a lot of different people coming to me and to, to other bird watchers. So uh, what I want to do is just go through, talk about identifying some of the common birds in your backyard, the kinds of feeds and how you feed them that are going to be most attractive to them, hopefully less attractive to things you don't want. Talk about some of the problems that we run into. And then quite honestly, as long as Cassie will let us stay online, I will be more than happy to answer questions. So let's get right to it. Birds are going to go where their needs are met. And their needs are very simple, just like you and me. They need food, they need water, they need shelter, they need cover from weather and predators, they need safe resting and roosting locations, nesting and brood rearing locations. So those are the three things that every every creature needs. Now, the order that is important to birds and especially getting the birds into your backyard may not be the order that you think they are. And we're gonna start with, with cover. Plainly and simply that house on the lower left-hand side that yard is not attractive to birds as it is now. That backyard on the lower right is very attractive to birds. Now, if you happen to live in the neighborhood there on the lower left, and I used to live there up until about a year ago, a yard like on the right is not gonna be well accepted in there. I live out on the farm on my, where my wife grew up now, so I can have as much crazy and wild things as I want. But when people contact me and say, Chuck, I'm just not getting any birds in my yard, one of the first things I start with is, 
what kind of landscaping do you have? And we could spend a whole additional hour and a half talking about that. Uh, water. Everybody feeds birds. Water, open water can be scarce, especially the past two weeks. It got cold. It was 20 below. And that's going to freeze up any unheated water. So sometimes water is more important than food. And then when it comes to food, I say, give them what they want, where they want it. I love to cook. I love to watch cooking shows. And, and it's 50% about what's on the plate, and 50% about what's presented to them. So we have many different kinds of feeders out there. We have hanging feeders. We have ground feeders. We have plastic circular tube feeders. We have fabric sack feeders. We got troughs. We got tray. It's the, I mean, you can even just throw birdseed out on your patio or your deck. They're probably going to find it. What I found over the years is that it helps people understand why they're getting the birds to their feeders and what they're doing if we first break our bird feed down into two basic types. The first one is oil seeds and soot. These are high fat, often higher protein than grains. They include sunflower, safflower, the nitro thistle, and peanuts. That fat is very important, especially after the last two weeks that we had. Grains are high carbohydrate, low fat, lower protein. Millet, mylor, sorghum, corn, wheat, oats. I tell people when they're looking at bird seed, if they're looking at a mix that has a lot of grains that we grow right around here in North Central Kansas, don't buy it. Go for some of the other stuff and we'll go into a lot more detail on that. I don't know how many times I've had people call me and say, Chuck, the birds are getting on the feeder and they're just throwing the feed out left and right with their beak and they're just wasting it on the ground. Well, the problem is they're putting grain-based feed into a hanging feeder. The kinds of birds that come to a hanging feeder want oil seeds or soot. They want sunflower seeds. The stuff that falls to the ground is still being eaten. It's just being eaten by doves, by sparrows. I don't mean house sparrows. I mean real sparrows. I've got some pictures of those here in a minute. But, but they really, it's, it's put it where they want it. Grains need to be low level because the the birds that are going to eat those grains like to feed on the ground. They like to scratch around and get to it. And I just talked about that. Um, oil seeds that do wind up on the ground will be consumed by almost any species. Everybody loves black oil sunflower seeds. So don't worry if stuff is on the ground. Feeders get that. They'll eat it too. The sparrows don't care. Oh, the northern cardinal. As I do programs the number one bird that people always seem to just love to have at their feeders are cardinals. And if you look at that beak, that's a big, heavy duty beak. It's designed for breaking open seeds and they really like the oil seeds. Sunflower, safflower, peanuts, and they like to be hanging, they like hanging feeders. They will feed on the ground. And honestly, watching them the past month or so, they're about 50-50. They'll come up to an to a elevated feeder, but they they have no trouble feeding on the ground but get the oil seeds out for them. Back in the 1990s, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did a, um, a research project all across the country, east to west, north to south, where they paid people to use different kinds of bird seeds in different kinds of feeders in different locations, and then watch who was eating what. Now, they never asked me. If they would have paid me to feed birds, I would have been happy to do it, but they didn't do that. So, what they found out out of this study is that black oil sunflower seed was the preferred food for most all species. Not was it only preferred for bird species, possums like it, raccoons like it, deer like it, black bear like it. Everybody likes black oil sunflower seed. The most efficient use of it is in raised or hanging feeders, but finches. That includes cardinals, house finches, goldfinches, blue jays, woodpeckers. They all love black oil sunflower seed. The other sunflower stripes, the black and the gray striped sunflower seed, what we would often call confectionery sunflowers, were eaten, but not as readily as the black oil sunflower. I think part of that is because the actual seed itself is larger and the kernel inside is larger. It's just harder for them to handle that. If you look at those, those striped sunflower seeds compared to a black oil sunflower seed, there's a big difference in size. 
Tufted Titmouse from about the Post Rock District on west in the state. This gray little bird, it becomes harder and harder to find. About the middle of the state, they really start to, to wane out and you get out to Western Kansas and it's not a common bird, but it's another bird that likes oil seeds, hanging feeders. The more timber, the more trees you have around your house, the more likely you are to have one of these. Now, white prozo millet. As a kid on the farm in Nebraska, I grew up in York County, Nebraska, for those of you that are interested. Um, my mom would put out seed mixes in a hanging feeder, probably one I made in, in, in um, my 4-H club. And it always had a lot of the white prozo millet in it. And I just see it get thrown out on the ground. Now I know for the reasons why. But I thought nothing was eating it. Probably 15 years later when I was in college, I was scratching around underneath the bird feeder one day and I realized that what I thought were seeds on the ground were actually just the seed coat of the millet. That little millet plant, that little millet seed has a, has a semi-clear, hard, shiny coat. And the birds pick this up and they pop that off and they eat the carbohydrate starchy endosperm inside. So what I was seeing all this wasted seed was actually just the seed coats. Now, put the millet in a ground or low raised feeders, juncos, which is a type of sparrow, doves, all the sparrows, they're all going to like the white prozo millet. Now, here are what I call some of the real sparrows. The, the Harris sparrow here in, in the upper right, upper, upper left, excuse me, upper left, uh, the white crown sparrow, the fox sparrow in the lower right, and then the junco, sometimes called the snowbird on the lower left. These are all winter residents in Kansas. They come down, this is their wintering area. When the spring starts coming around, they go back north or they head west into the mountains. The Harris Sparrow up here in the upper left, they go all the way up to the Arctic and nest on the tundra. So they got a long trip ahead of us. Interestingly, I had a friend do a study several years ago about the departure time for some of these birds. The juncos are gone by about the 20th of April. Harris sparrows will stick around until about the 10th of May, and then they just, they're gone. They just disappear. So it's kind of fun to watch them. We've, we've got a lot of sparrows in Kansas. These are just some of the more striking sparrows, some of the more regularly seen sparrows. Now, safflower is another oil seed. It, it grows, I mean, it's used as safflower oil, sometimes in cooking. It is somewhat less preferred than sunflower. It is a smaller seed than sunflower. It looks like a small white sunflower seed. Cardinals and house finches are fairly fond of safflower seed. I have seen house finches pick up a, in, in a mixed feeder, pick up a sunflower seed, throw it back and then go and get the safflower seed. So that, that they are somewhat particular to it. Squirrels seem unattracted to safflower. Safflower is a little bit more expensive than sunflower. It used to be hard to find, but I can usually find it now at places like Orchland's Tractor Supply, uh, usually up to a 20, 25 pound bag. But if you're having troubles with squirrels, and I'll talk about some other tricks for dealing with them. Uh, try some safflower, use it in hanging or raised feeders. House finch and purple finch. The house finch is in the upper left, purple finch is in the lower right. Two very closely related birds. Uh, the house finch was originally only on the west coast, west of the Sierra Nevadas, California, Washington, Oregon. In the 1930s, unscrupulous pet shop owners were trapping them in California, hauling them to New York City and selling them as caged birds, calling them Hollywood linnets. They have beautiful songs. I love what, listening to House Finches sing. I was listening to one scene today when I left the office. Well, the, the precursor to the Fish and Wildlife Service found out about this, and they set up a sting operation to catch them. Word got out. All the pet shop owners released the House Finches into the wild. They established in New York City. And ever since then, that population has been moving back west. The California population worked its way up and over the Sierra Nevadas and started working their way east. And in the 1980s, they met in Kansas. They are now a permanent resident. Um, but they weren't native here. You go back to the 1970s, they weren't around. Older bird books won't show them being anywhere in the central US. People sometimes, the, the purple finch is a, is a species of the, of the Arctic, of the Arctic t timber of the high mountain regions. It is only gonna be here in the wintertime. 
Now, this time of year, and this year we have a lot of purple finches. Some years we don't have very many at all. Some years we have a lot. This is what they call an eruptive year, and they erupt into Kansas. Um, and so they're, we're, they're showing up at a lot of bird feeders. People try to match, is it reddish or is it rosy red? Is it purplish plum? Don't worry about the color because every bird is different and each bird book can have slight imperfections. What I tell people is, look at the streaking on the side and belly of the bird. A house finch has a lot, it's fairly well defined and it tends to be brown. The purple finch doesn't have a lot, it's far more diffused and it tends to be more of that reddish rosy color than brown. So that's, that's the way to tell the males apart. Um, they like the oil seeds, the ground or raised feeders, they'll, they'll really, they'll eat about anything. They're picking up grains underneath my feeders all the time. These are two species where actually the females are easier to tell apart. The female purple finch has this nice bright white eyebrow. The house finch, well, she's just kind of dull brown. But again, oil seeds, just about anywhere, grains on the ground, they're going to find what they can. They'll scratch around underneath feeders all the time. So our house finch and purple finch, purple finches will probably be gone by the end of April. House finches nest all across the state. They'll be here year round. Now, Niger thistle seed. Niger is an oil seed, very small oil seed. And if you're like me and you grew up as a kid having to, to chop thistles out of fields, especially pastures and fence rows, the word thistle just gives you shudders. This is not related to those kind of thistles. It is a tropical plant. Um, the finches love it. House finches love it. And so I encourage people to use it in a tube feeder that got those very narrow slit openings. The goldfinch and the pine siskin, which I'll talk about in a second, can get through there and get those out very, very easily. Now, it is expensive. I sometimes have called it black gold. Um, the problem with it is it goes rancid very quickly. If it's the first of June and you still have a bag of, of niger thistle seed, just go out and dump it on the ground underneath your bird feeders and let, ha let whoever wants it have it. Because unless you put it in the freezer, it'll be rancid by the end of the summer. I have quit feeding niger thistle seed. I now get sunflower chips and parts um, where it's just the, the, the kernel out of the sunflower seed. Those will go through those, those uh, two pairs just fine and it, they don't go bad as quick and they're eaten just as readily. So I have a lot of people say, I've put out my thistle seed, nothing's eating it. I say, dump it out and buy a new bag. Now I just say, dump it out and buy sunflower chips. There we have our goldfinch. Uh, right now, they look like the bird on the right. They, they've still got their winter clothes on. But if you look at them, they're starting to get pops and of just bright feathers starting to show up. They're starting to molt. In the summertime, they're going to look like, like the goldfinch on the left. They're bright yellow. Some people call them lemons with wings. Some people call them wild canaries. I don't care. But they go through two full molts every year, which is different from a lot of birds. But, but they're in the process of starting slowly going into their to their what they call their, their alternate plumage or their breeding plumage right now. And, and some of them are just dappled. They look, yeah, they're just hilarious to look at sometimes. They're great. The siskin is another one of those finches closely related to the goldfinch. It is another one of those eruptive finches like the purple finch. Some years they are as common as goldfinches. Other years you hardly see a single one. This is one of those years when there are a lot of them. Um, people say, well, I can't tell whether it's a female goldfinch, a female house finch, excuse me, or a pine siskin. A couple things to look at is, first of all, a lot of times you'll see this little bit of yellow on the tail or on the wing. The, the bird is also only about two thirds the size of a house finch. It's not nearly as plump as a house finch. To me, a house finch is kind of plump, like been eating a few too many thistle seeds or something. The other thing is the pine siskin has a very delicate little beak. If you look at this beak, it's very small and pointed. A house finch has a much larger conical beak. So that's a, an easy way for me at least to tell them apart. And I tell people, if you question whether it's a house finch or a siskin, it's probably a house finch. When you see the pine siskin, you will know it for sure. Now soot. Soot is nothing more than animal fat. The good soot is the, is the fat around the kidneys of, of cows. More information than you wanted to know about soot. It's a very good source of energy. 
Fat is very, very important. I'm going to get into another whole few slides about that here in a minute. But you can feed it raw, rendered, mixed with various seeds or peanut butter. When we were first married, and my wife is a bird watcher, I will add. She was a bird watcher before we even met. But I rendered down some suet like my mom and I used to do. And it's really something you shouldn't do inside the house, to be right honest. And and she walked in the house that Saturday evening and said, what is that smell? I said, I rendered down some soot. And she said, that's nice. Don't ever do it again. Now I just go out, go out and buy these these pre-prepared little little um, squares. You can get them again, a box of them. I saw them on sale the other day for 62 cents a piece. So it's just a lot less work. Preferred by woodpeckers, chickadees, nuthatches, brown creepers, even starlings. Um, this is the old style suet cake that is only going to work good in, in cold weather. It gets up to 80 degrees. This is going to melt and fall into a puddle underneath the bird feeder. They have a lot of what I what they call all season suet now, usually blended with corn cornmeal or peanut butter. That will stay just fine all through the year. I buy them by the by a box of 10 or 12 of them at a time. Woodpeckers are some that just love these soot cakes. On the right is a red-bellied woodpecker. On the left is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. There is such a bird as a sapsucker. Uh, these are not to scale. The red-bellied woodpecker is noticeably larger than the yellow-bellied sapsucker. I just got him so they would fit on the screen better. If you've ever noticed in your trees, this picture down here with all these nice little holes and thought, oh my gosh, I've got, got you know, boars coming out of my tree. If they're all lined up like this, they're about the size of a pencil on, on a size of an eraser on a number two pencil. This is what a sap sucker does. Sap suckers are here from October to April. And they make these what we call sap wells, and they actually do eat the sap out of them. But the sap also attack, attracts insects that get stuck in the sap. And then the sap sucker has an easy meal of both protein the insect and a high energy or high sugar source in the sap. So that's why they do that. If you see it on your tree, don't worry. Normally the tree is going to heal that over in just one growing season. So it's not a big deal. Um, all woodpeckers are going to like the oil seeds are going to like soot. Here we have the hairy woodpecker on the left, the Danny woodpecker on the right. There, this again, not to scale. If they were side by side like this on a tree, you'd have no trouble telling them apart. The downies are just a little bitty thing, smallest woodpecker in the United States, maybe the smallest woodpecker in the world. It's about half the size of a hairy. We never get them side by side on a feeder. They're always one or the other. So people get confused by that. And I say, don't sweat it. Look at the beak. The downy is a small woodpecker. It's got a tiny little pencil lead style beak. The hairy woodpecker has more of what I call a real woodpecker bill. So good stout bill or a tiny little bill. Males will have a lot more red on the back of the head. There's also some differences in, in, in all this, but I just say, don't get hung up on the dots and stripes and all this other stuff. Look at the beak. Couple more of our soot feeders and just a couple of little clowns in my opinion. Uh, the bird on the lower left is the white-breasted nuthatch. This bird is here year round. They nest across most of Kansas. Um, chunky little bird. Upper right is the red-breasted nuthatch. Some years we have a lot of them, like this year. Some years we don't have hardly any. They have occasionally nested in Kansas, but not routinely. But the red-breasted is about two-thirds the size of the white-breasted. Um, just look to see if it's got all white around the eye, or if it's got a black stripe through the eye and a white line above the eye. Very easy to tell them apart. Oil seeds, soot, hanging feeders. These are those nervous little Nellies. They're going to dash in grab a bite or two of food and go off. They'll come in, grab a sunflower seed, go off and stash it behind the bark someplace. And then they're just always coming and going. They don't seem to sit still very long. They're kind of like that, that second grader that's just got all that nervous energy inside of them. A lot of people buy the mixes. And the reason they buy them is because they're cheap. Cheap mixes are more grain than oil seed. The mix that I show here is a mix that I got a few years ago from a bird store down in Topeka. It's a very good mix. It is virtually all oil seeds, a little bit of millet in it, but mainly oil seeds. Um, and the more oil seeds that's in it, the better it is. But most of them like, and I'll be honest, I go out and I, I buy a 50 pound bag of a grain mix at Orschland's on a regular basis. 
but I also feed it on in the ground on the ground in a trough. It's eighty probably eighty percent millet. So the birds are going to get into that. You know, the sparrows that are down there, uh, the cardinals will get in there. And I got a couple of possums that come wandering by in warmer weather. So, you know, I got to keep them well fed too. But I honestly tell people if you just have one feeder, buy black oil sunflower seed. Yes, the pound, you know, the 40 pound bag is going to be more, but you're not going to go through it as fast because they're not going to be throwing everything out on the ground, wasting it. If you want a second feeder, Consider putting something down on the ground and put one of the cheaper mixes down there. And then you can go to a, a thistle seed feeder or a soot feeder or something like that. But uh, for the most part, especially in a hanging feeder, I would just get straight black oil sunflower seed. Got to have our chickadees. We have the black cap chickadee in the upper left, Carolina chickadee in the lower right. If you're north of about the first two counties of southern Kansas, don't worry about the Carolina chickadee. They're slowly moving north about a mile every couple of years. Uh, most of us are going to be gone before they get this far north. They are more adapted to warmer climates than black cap chickadee. What we have up here is the black cap chickadee. So they're going to be like the nuthatches, like the tit mice. Dive in, grab a seed or two, get back out and get up into the tree where they feel safer. So a lot of energy. Chickadees are what I call the early warning system in the bird world. They're, they're sedentary. They stay in one part of the, of the area all the time. So they're always on the lookout for potential dangers. And other birds like to hang around with chickadees because if there is a threat, a hawk, a cat, they're usually the first bird to give an alarm call. Alarm calls go across species and they indicate whether a threat is ground-based or aerial-based. If it's ground-based like a cat, all the birds go straight up. If it's aerial based, like a hawk coming through, they will dive into dense cover. They'll try to find the densest cover they can and dive into it. So chickadees are good to have around. They're the early warning system. Okay. In recent days, the past month or so, and, and some of you probably have seen some of this stuff on Facebook as well, discussion about instead of dumping bacon grease down the drain, which I would never do, never ever do, they're saying, take oatmeal, the rolled oats, uncooked, and just put in it and soak it up and then put it out for the birds. Or they, they talk about feeding bread. Should they or shouldn't they? Feeding raw, uncooked rice. Is it a bad thing? Is it not? Okay, so what I do is I try to break stuff down because I'll be honest, there's not a lot of research on this stuff. Now, bird feed packages carry nutritional analysis, just like everything you buy in the grocery store does. Human nutrition labels are based on serving size and percent of daily requirements. Bird feed packages are treated like livestock feed and it's proximate analysis. It's going to be this much protein, this much fat, and so forth. So if you're trying to compare oatmeal or rolled, rolled oats or, or raw rice to sunflower seeds, you've got to do some trick around there. Thing to keep in mind, protein maintains and builds muscles. Fat provides energy for heat production. If you crave a lot of things that aren't necessarily good for us, like bacon when it's cold, there's a metabolical reason for that. And I would eat bacon all the time. Okay, if you look at your bird seed, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, they've all got this simple little label on them. Guaranteed analysis over here on the upper right. Crude protein, 23%. Crude fat, 40%. This is a seed log or a seed cake. This is soot, and it's hard to get off that plastic without getting a reflection sometimes. Soot cakes don't have a lot of protein in them, but they've got a lot of fat. So if you start looking at that and thinking to the kind of weather we've had, oh, this one up here with 8% protein, 3% fat, that's my seed mix. It's primarily millet. So I started breaking this down. Okay, let's look at this. The top table is some of the common things we're going to feed in our feeders. Sunflower seed, 14% protein, 33% fat. Safflower, 11%, 25%. Peanuts, 23, 40. Here's that seed mix. It's primarily millet, 8% protein, 3% fat. Soot cake and seed cake. Soot cake is low protein, but high fat. Seed cake is higher protein and high fat. So when it gets cold, everything's going to start hitting those high fat feeds. Now we look at down here and I pulled sunflower down just so it could be a reference. Raw oatmeal 
is 12% protein. Oats are actually higher protein than a lot of our grains. 6% fat. Raw rice that you'd throw at a wedding. 7% protein, 0% fat. Bread, 9% protein, and that may be generous, 4% fat. I'm not fond of these feeds, especially in cold weather. A lot of people were asking me, Chuck, it's 15 below this morning. I've run out of bird seed. I don't want to get out in this weather. And I said, what, can I, what do I have in my house that I can use? And I said, don't worry about it. Your feeders, even if you live out in the country like I do, birds will fly quarter, half, three quarters of a mile very quickly and find another feeder. Your, your backyard is one stop on a huge buffet line, especially if you live in town. If you ran out, just don't worry about it. When it warms up, refill the feeder. They'll be back quickly. Now, somebody's going to say, okay, well, we're taking that oatmeal and we're soaking it in the bacon grease, which is high in fat. So is that okay? Well, I guarantee you, they will eat it. <coughs> the birds will eat it. I would eat bacon three meals a day, but it's not advisable. Just because we like it doesn't mean it's good for us. Bacon grease and virtually any cooking oil we produce in our house is exposed to high temperatures and can get all sorts of secondary products. Additionally, um, things like nitrosamines are used in bacon in the curing process. We simply don't know because we don't have the research about the impact of these on birds. Well, they're not eating very much. Yeah, but you're talking about something that weighs just a few grams. My comment is, Stick to the bird seeds that are packaged and sold of it. Yes, soot is a form of animal fat, but it is rendered down at very low heat. Soot is going to melt at about 140 degrees. It's going to get soft and drippy at 80, 85, and it's going to be fully liquid at 140 degrees. You're not going to get all sorts of unwanted byproducts that way. Okay, problems. I get a lot of calls about no birds of the feeders. And once we get past the fact that, yes, they do have nice landscaping around, <laughs> I, I talk about heightened awareness. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, we had, um, I didn't mean to do that, but we had a, a study come out that they said that since 1970, 25% of the birds in, a, in the United States and Canada have disappeared, have died and not been replaced. First of all, yes, it is accurate. That is correct. So that immediately puts people, oh my gosh, we're losing the birds. So they become more aware. But what more often happens is I'm getting that question in October and November and December. Early on in the fall season, we still have a lot of seed available out there in the wild. And birds, especially migratory birds that are moving into the area, will often hit those weed patches, those fields, areas where there are natural seeds available. Then it comes down to, is there open water or is it all ice covered? That can make a difference as to whether something's coming in or not. If it's, you know, late November, early December, and we have a four inch snowfall, you know that your feeders are going to get hit hard by birds because all that food's gotten covered up. Sun comes out, day or two later, it's all cleared off. They disappear again. Then we get into this time of year, and, and really to me, the bird feeding season, while I feed year round, the heavy hit on the bird feeding season starts in January and February because the natural food sources are getting used up. If you've got mild weather, it doesn't take as much energy for them to stay warm. They're not, their demand isn't so high, but we have harsh weather, and boy, did we have harsh weather the past two weeks. They're going to be hitting the feeders hard. Snow cover or no snow cover, I've already talked about that. It, can they get to the food that is left out there? Cats are a problem. They are not native to the North American ecosystem. My wife and I love cats. We had one for 14 years. Um, they simply do not belong outside. Some people say, well, put a bell on the cat. I watched a cat with a collar and a bell stalk and kill a bird, and that bell didn't ring until it landed on the final pounce. I've known people to use squirt guns, sometimes laced with a little bit of ammonia water to spray down the cat in their yard. I've known people who've resorted to paintball guns and uh, doesn't make the, home, the owner of the cat very happy, but ultimately try to talk with the, with the homeowner and say, keep it indoors. This is a hot topic. I don't really want to spend any more time on it, but cats are a problem. Uh, then there's the old bird of prey. 
This is a shot my wife got in our backyard several years ago of a sharp shinned hawk that just made short work of a junco. I'll move off of that now. Um, my comment is, hey, they're birds too, and it is a bird feeder. When you're out in nature, you're always going to wind up being second place on somebody's food chain. Uh, so simply realize that hawks are going to come through. Try to create as much habitat with protective cover as possible. Um, and then you just know that you're occasionally going to lose one. People will invariably say, I don't mind them taking that starling, but I wish they'd take, I did, I hated it when they take the cardinal. Well, if there were starling feathers there, you probably wouldn't notice them anyway. But um, if you've ever had a day when you've been looking at your bird feeders and there's birds just everywhere, and then all of a sudden they're all gone except one lone little goldfinch that's just sitting there frozen on the bird feeder. There's a hawk in the neighborhood. If you walk outside, you will probably scare the hawk away. Hawks, when they hunt, they, they focus in on movement and their eye is so much more adept at catching movement than our uh, eyes are. As long as that little goldfinch doesn't move, it's probably going to be okay. But if it panics and starts to fly, it's in trouble if it can't get to shelter quick enough. So just provide shelter. End of the year, we always get a real Christmas tree. My Christmas tree after Christmas goes out and it's sitting outside by the feeders. And I've seen a lot of birds the past two weeks hopping in and out of that Christmas tree. So just a synopsis, no birds. Do you have adequate cover? Do you have bad feet? Sometimes it happens cats or hawks and then I tell people people to just hang out by the feeders and think like a bird for some of us you know it's really easy for me to think like a bird I'm a bit of a bird brain but if you just sit quietly outside your ho house sometimes you would be surprised at the noises you hear coming from the house maybe the television maybe just somebody walking across and a cupboard door going slammed or people talking it's just it's amazing how much noise comes out and sometimes that's all it's going to take to startle a bird not the birds you want. Starlings, blue jays, house sparrows, grackles, red winged black. Have I missed any that people hate? Um, it, it, some of it is going to be what you're feeding and how you're feeding it. Another thing about the oatmeal, I forgot to mention earlier, the species that loves oats more than anything else is starlings. Starlings also love soot. So let's take a, a grain that they already love, put it with fat that they already love, and you're just asking to get starlings in your yard. And right there is another good reason not to do it. Um, the other thing I say is you put out a buffet and everyone and anyone is liable to stop by. What you feed and how you feed it can make a difference. It can reduce some of the interlopers that you don't care for. Um, in town, you're going to have more starlings. Out here in the country, I haven't seen near the starlings they used to have in town. So just it, sometimes it's just a trial and error. And sometimes you just take all the feeders down for a week then put them back out. Now, I've got to put a picture of a blue jay in here. They're really pretty birds. And of course, Junction City High School is the blue jays. My wife graduated from there, so I always have to put in a good word for that. But blue jays and crows and ravens and magpies are corvids. We call them the corvidae family, not covids, but corvids. They are the smartest of all birds. They are incredibly intelligent. They can do pr simple problem solving. So it's really, you got to tip your hat to them because they're very ingenious. Uh, disease of the bird feeder. It can happen. Out in Colorado and parts of southwest Kansas, they were having troubles this winter with pine siskins dying from, and it escapes me now what it is. We did not see that this far north in, in the state. Um, but sanitation is important. Regularly clean up all the spilled seed in halls. Um, I don't do it as often as I should. Mother Nature a lot of times blows a lot of things away, but if you get a lot of, of seed, seeds and hulls underneath the feeders and into the vegetation, wait until it's dry for a week or so and get out there with a shop vac. You can get all that stuff cleaned up with a shop vac really fast. Now, I'm sure there was more than once that my neighbors in town said, oh, look, Adi's out there vacuuming his lawn again, um, but it does work. Um, you disinfect at least once or twice a year any feeders with about a 3% bleach in water, and then sunshine, ultraviolet light that the sun gives off plenty of is a great disinfectant. Then start fill it back up. House finches are probably our biggest problem. They get conjunctivitis, pink eye, and you know it when you see it because all of a sudden you see this house finch that isn't flying very much. You start looking closely and the eyes are getting all crusted over. The bird is gonna die. If you start seeing that happen, 
pull in all the feeders, clean up all the feed, disinfect for about a week, kind of let it run its course, and then you can put the feeders back out. The birds are not going to starve to death in that short period of time. They will move on to, to other other feeders in the neighborhood, in the in the wherever you live. Um, but that way, it just kind of cleans it up. The the bacteria or whatever the causal agent of the conjunctivitis comes out through the feces. They tend to poop where they eat, so they they wind up picking it up and and it just kind of starts carrying it through. So you've just got to get everything cleaned up and let it get get out of its system, you might say. Um, this is a trough that I had on my on my uh, deck in town before the boxwood got too high and covered it up. But you know, I would I would vacuum that all out and vacuum out underneath there a couple times a year, and then just throw some bleach and water in and let it dry out for a couple of days and fill it back up. But sunshine is an excellent disinfectant. Oh, the squirrel! Yeah, that that's a just a brave little squirrel there with one hand on the shepherd's hook and one hand on the feeder, saying, "You got a problem with this." Um, in my opinion, there are no squirrel proof devices, no squirrel proof feeders. There are squirrel deterrents, but nothing is truly squirrel proof because they're just so tricky. They do love corn. Put out an ear of corn, offer them a peace offering. Um, the other thing you can do is to start lacing your feed down with cayenne or red pepper, not chili powder. It's not hot enough, but cayenne pepper. Birds have different taste, taste receptors in their mouth they don't taste the capsation. It doesn't give them the burning effect like it does to you, me, and the squirrel. Um, and it will work. I, I would every once in a while get tired of them in tan and, and lay it down on top of my sunflower seed in the trough you just saw. And after a while, I'd see a, a squirrel down at the bird bath drinking and then rubbing his cheeks with his little paws. It's like he's trying to figure out what's going on there. Uh, had a possum that was getting into a feeder one night. And, and possums, defecate where they eat. It's a deterrent so other things won't eat where they're eating. Um, and that was, I was going to get out there and clean that stuff out every day. So I was going out there and lacing it down every evening with cayenne pepper. Eventually I lit him up and he left for a while. Um, but it's not going to hurt the birds. You can buy seed that's pre-treated. It's a little bit expensive, but you can go to the discount stores and buy a huge bottle of, of cayenne or red pepper and treat a lot of seed. Word of warning, do not let a little gust of wind blow that back up into your face. It happened to me once and it hurt. I know why pepper spray works. Um, cayenne, the red pepper will work on all these problems. Raccoons are simply destructive. They are ingenious. They're curious. They've got the opposable thumb and they will tear things apart. Uh, possums are just messy. Skunks aren't usually feeding on the spilled seed. They're feeding on insects feeding on the spillage. Rodents are feeding on the spillage. So that's another reason to just keep things cleaned up every once in a while. Possums, I try to tolerate. We don't have pets here. We don't have livestock around and they do eat a lot of ticks. So I try to give possums a, a little bit of a break. Don't forget water. There's a lot of new uh, different heated devices. Some people just use a, a a heated dog water. Um, I just have a bird bath and I've used that same model of, of um, bird bath heater for a long time. It's, a, it's about a $50 purchase. It lasts for quite a few years. It's thermostatically controlled. So come home this afternoon, 62 degrees here. It was not on. But when it hit 1820 below, it kept the bird bath open every single night. So having open water in this time of year will also bring things to the to the yard that won't normally eat feeds, things like Eastern bluebirds, cedar waxwings, and American robins. These won't normally come to most seed food sources unless you're putting out mealworms. Um, and cedar waxwings won't even come to that. But having a bird bath there can be an, an invite to them. Remember, you put out a buffet and absolutely anything is liable to stop by. Maybe two legs with two wings, maybe four legs, six legs, eight legs, no legs. If you really don't want to see potentially weird critters in your backyard, quit feeding the birds because it is honestly a buffet. Final thoughts. You don't have to identify all the birds at your feeder. You don't have to identify any of the birds at your feeder. One of the reasons we feed birds is because they bring us joy and pleasure. I mean, there's nothing better on that, you know, that some of those cold days but I fortunately didn't have to go to work, that I could just sit there and watch the birds coming into the feeder. Of course, in about twice a day, I had to get up 
bundle up and go out in the cold to, to refill the feeders, but it was worth it. It's about having fun. And if you call it a, a red bird instead of a northern cardinal, I don't care. If you call it a, a wild canary instead of a goldfinch, I don't care. If they bring you joy, that's what it's all about. Will it make an impact on how many survive the winter? It may have a little bit of an impact. There's a lot of studies on that. We don't know for sure. We honestly feed for one reason, to get them closer to the house so that we can see them, but have fun doing it. That is my email address. That is my office phone number. The ksbirds.org website is one that we maintain, um, that I maintain for the Kansas Ornithological Society. It has a wealth of information on there. You can find checklists for the birds that have been documented in all 105 counties in the state. Um, so it's it's great. Those next two links, the HNR, KDI State, and the GearyCanExtension.com, those are both going to take you to a page where you can get, I have a series of eight backyard birding guides. Talks about bird feed, uh, a whole guide specifically on soot. Talks about bird uh, bird books, birding equipment, binoculars, hummingbird feeding. One quick word on hummingbird feeding, we're getting close. Um, get your feeders out by April 15th. Um, but that's where you can find those. So let me get out of that. And I think that Cassie is going to send out this and, and I have provided her with, with a PDF of all these slides so you can see them. And I guess I'll let, turn it back. I'm going to take a drink here real quick, Cassie, and then I'll turn it back to you to, to you know, kind of handle this. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. That was awesome. I loved that picture of the little squirrel grabbing the feeder. That was great. Um, I do have a quick poll I'm going to put up just to some fun facts about birds. We can see how many bird lovers we have in the audience. So I'll give a couple seconds to do that. And then we do have a couple of questions in the chat. And if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. I guess I'll read it for the, the people on Facebook. I'm not sure they can see this poll, but the first question is how many bird feeders do you have out? And then what is your biggest issue feeding birds? And lastly, are you excited and want to continue to watch birds? So I'll give like 10 more seconds on that. Okay, let me share the results. All right, it looks like we have lots of people that have four or more feeders, so that's great. Seven. <laughs> um, okay, then some, some issues, lots of squirrels, and everybody says they're excited to continue or start watching birds. That's the, awesome. the pandemic has been an interesting, I mean, interesting. It's been mind boggling, but a lot of people have found bird feeding, backyard bird watching, and just bird watching in general to be a safe thing that they can do with their family or, or living unit. And we've seen a, a, an amazing increase in bird watching um, happening from this. So uh, do you want to start reading the, the questions to me, Cassie or? Yes, I can do that. And we'll probably okay. just go until seven o'clock. So, okay. <laughs> the first and, question... and just before we start on that, if you don't get your question answered, um, email me. I'll be more than happy to, to, it may take me a couple of days to get to all of them, but if I don't get it answered, just um, go ahead and, and email it to me. Okay. So somebody wants to know how you can avoid um, birds flying into windows. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a big one. There's a lot of research being done on that right now. Uh, birds fly into windows because the feeders are close to the windows and they get startled. And they don't realize it. But the big thing is they see the glass, they see the reflection. And it, to them, it looks like a continuation of outside. And so, bam, they're just going to fly right on through it. Um, there's a lot of work being done. And I think in the next five years, we're going to have, have a lot better solutions because we found out the birds see into the spectrums that we don't see. And they're coming up with, with treatments that you can put on the windows that are virtually or are invisible to us, but they're just like a glowing neon light to, to birds. They're up in the ultraviolet black light range. So 
there's hope on that. Um, if you're going to use cutouts or something like that, they have to be on the outside of the glass. Uh, because the because if you put it on the inside of the glass, they see the reflection first. Um, some people put nets up and just use that. Um, you know, I've seen people that and, and cardinals now cardinals attack the, the glass in your home because they see the reflection. They're driving the other cardinal out of their territory. Just put paper bags over the outside of the glass. It's the only way you're going to stop them. But for right now, the and I've seen if you can find it, it's a very it's like a, a whiteout pin, but it's very, very fine. And you put up and down lines, that vertical, yeah. Put up and down lines about one inch apart and you just, you don't see them, but the birds do see it. So if you start Googling and start searching on the internet for white paint bird collision, that kind of thing, you should be able to track those down. Okay, and then we have a couple questions about attracting specific birds like hummingbirds and orioles. Why don't you have me back here in a couple of months to do my hummingbird program? Um, there's a lot of landscaping you can do. Hummingbirds and orioles are going to be interactive, and I did see one roll by, so I'll answer that right now. Four parts water, one part sugar. Uh, just keep it at that. Don't change it with the weather. Um, if you get it too much sugar, they won't get enough water. And, and, Hummingbirds get a lot of their liquid through their nectar. So that's why I don't like to get it too strong. But um, putting out, and if you go to the, to the website where those backyard, uh, backyard bird guides are, I've got one whole um, bulletin on landscaping for hummingbirds, hummingbird specific plants that are very good. Um, and I can get a list up, up to Cassidy to do there, but landscaping helps. And then put out hummingbird feeders in the plural. Uh, have a couple of them. Uh, we put up one, two, three, we put four hummingbird feeders up at our house here in the country. Um, they, the more the merrier. They're going to hit the state about the 15th of April. They're going to be hell bent for leather to get up to the breeding range. A few stick around from about Highway 81 east. Um, and I tell people if it's the 5th of June and you don't have any hummingbirds coming to your feeder, take your hummingbird feeder down until the last week of July, then put it back up because when they start heading south in late July, and yes, that's when the southbound migration starts for hummingbirds, um, they've got all the time in the world. They're through the breeding season and they will take all the time they've got. So make sure you have that feeder up and focus on plants blooming in August. August, August and September are the peak months. And that's when all the fun happens with hummingbirds. Orioles put out a feeder. They'll come to the hummingbird feeder. You can get an Oriole feeder, the same four to one water sugar ratio. Um, just put it up. A lot of them will get a lot that come through. They may stop for a few days and they go on. So that's, that's a quick version of that. Okay. And then we have a question from Facebook about like what type of water feeder you used and like how close you put your bird back to the, the bird feeder. The bird, the, the bird feeders. I've actually got one bird bath right next to my bird feeder and I'm sick and tired of cleaning sunflower seeds out of the bird bath, but that's okay. It's, it's an easy place. We've got a West window and a North window in, in the living room of our house here on the farm. And we've got a lot of them out the West window where we've got, they actually hang underneath the, the front porch. Um, but it's, I've got them just a few feet away. And I have hummingbirds away from, from finch feeders. That's, that's not a problem. Okay. Someone wants to know what's the best way to feed mealworms to bluebirds? Wow. Mealworms to bluebirds. Mealworms to bluebirds. Yeah. I, I knew where she was heading with that. <laughs> um, what I really, you know, a lot of people just put them out in a dish. They do, they are starting to have some, some hanging feeders. And once the bluebirds get used to it, they'll take it. I've got a friend up in Holton that literally just has a metal dish uh, screwed down to, to her deck railing. And she just puts it out there every morning. And if she's very late getting them out, um, they'll, they'll be there waiting for her when she gets out there with them. Okay. Um, will birds drink from a heated stock tank? The, the problem with a stock tank is a lot of times it's too deep. They, they don't have a safe place where they can get to it. The other thing is, you know, if it's well heated, um, they'll be okay. But if, if it's metal, there's a risk they could, there's a chance they could, you know, get frozen to it, the old tongue on the flagpole trick. Um, most of the time, that's not going to be a problem. But usually it's just, it's too deep. They don't feel safe getting into it. If there's nothing else around, oh yeah, they'll, they'll figure out a way to get into it. 
Okay. How many hanging bird feeders do you recommend? How many do you want to fill? <laughs> that, that, that's really what it comes down to. How much bird seed do you want to buy? Um, I like to have, I've got one that's just straight black oil sunflower. I have a, a soot feeder. I have one that's just a tube feeder for the, the tube the feeder, soot feeder, soot feeder, S U E T. It's just like a I wire cage. Um, and then I've got a, one of those seed cakes. It's just, it's like, it's circular with a hole down through and you just pop it down through. And then I've got, so I've got a second tube feeder out the back door, um, hanging off my arbor that has a larger opening. So I just put black oil sunflower seeds. So you can put as many as you want. I've also just got a wooden trough that's hollowed out like a feed trough that I, that I put feed in for the ground feeding birds. So you can just have all the fun in the world. And sometimes some feeders just won't attract birds for some reason. Try different seeds. It just doesn't work. Take it down, use it for decoration. <laughs> okay. Speaking of like the type of feeders, someone wants to know if the um, feeds at specialty stores, are they grossly overpriced or does the quality make them a good value? Oh, I guess they're talking about the, the, the feed. The feed, yeah, the, the bird seed. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I do think that the seed that I get, and, and that there is a difference in brands. I bought one at a store that I don't normally buy from, some sunflower Ooh. seeds, and I really oh. thought it was, I mean, it was trashy stuff. I mean, there was just a lot more trash than normal in it. Um, but it's you just have to find what works for you. Um, there was a... a big ruckus out um from one big seed so i mean i got a check for a couple hundred dollars uh because there was a class action lawsuit and because there was they had not done an adequate job of screening for pesticides um it, which i did bought more bird seed with but um i think there there is more attention if you're concerned about am i getting an organic bird seed source and yeah go to a specialty store find a specialty supplier um and do it that way but, uh, you know, I, I tend to avoid the really cheap places. Um, I, I, I don't get any reimbursement from them, but I buy mo most of my bird seed from Orchlands because it's convenient for me to get in and, and they have what I like. So, of course, Orchlands was just bought by Tractor Supply, so we'll see how that changes in the coming year. Okay, we have a question about using corn and also peanuts. Peanuts, as long as they're not salted, peanuts are fine. Um, you can put out whole peanuts. Blue Jays love whole peanuts. Um, the shelled peanuts, a lot of birds like that. Nut hatches, um, the woodpeckers um, will get in there and they'll start pecking those things apart. Uh, corn, I'm not that fond of. Corn tends to attract a lot of starlings, blackbirds, things that we don't want. It's a much bigger seed, seed if you try to feed it whole. What I use corn for, I use ear corn. I sneak up here when the renter has has planted corn for a uh, for a crop, and then get a five gallon bucket and use that. And I feed the squirrels the corn. That's my peace offering. Okay, awesome. Um, if you have a good tree branch, is there any reason to use a feeding station like the pole with the metal branches? No, no. If you've got any place to hang it, I mean, I just put put hooks up in the in the, in the porch and hang it from that i've hung stuff from branches now if you got a branch close by where you can see it easily no problem using it big windstorms will sometimes knock them down you can put it back up okay let's do one more um how do you keep starlings off your feeders how do you keep starlings off your feeders um that mainly comes back to if you get a lot of them and they keep coming in especially if you're in town just take everything down for a while just take everything down for a while and try to get them to move someplace else. Starlings will be starting to break up pretty soon into breeding pairs. So that problem will take care of itself. Uh, if you have them raiding just your soot feeder, there are soot feeders that instead of holding the, the cake like this, it holds it horizontal. It's got a roof over it. And to get to it, the woodpecker has to come up from underneath. Starlings can't are, are not a perching bird like that. So they have problems with that. And that has, has tended to work pretty good for some people. But sometimes you just get overrun with something, whether it's grackles, blackbirds, whatever, you just have to take it down and wait a week or two and then put it back up and hope they've moved on to bother somebody else. And yes, use jelly on, on Oriole feeders. They love it. A lot of discussion about whether it's good or bad. I don't think they get that much of where it's going to mess them up. 
grape jelly. That's the only one they like. Okay, awesome. Well, I don't think we got to quite everything, but if you have specific questions, feel free to email Chuck or I or your local extension agent. Yeah, give um, me your local agent and say, give this to Chuck, the bird guy, the bird agent. <laughs> yes, you are well known as being the bird guy. <laughs> and I see several names that I recognize. Hi to all the folks out there that I know. Good to see you tonight. <laughs> Well, thank you, Chuck. Um, this was awesome. I learned a lot. I think everybody really enjoyed it. Um, we did record it and I will send this out to your emails um, by the end of the week. And then I also am gonna include a short survey in that. And if you could fill that out, that really helps us just to communicate our impact um, during this weird COVID time. So um, thanks everyone. I hope you all have a great rest of your week and go outside and enjoy some birds. And whoever has their cat inside, thank you for having it inside. I see that. Bye-bye, <laughs> all. Take care.